Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The West Side is a haven for immigrant communities arriving in St. Paul, Minnesota. Historically, it has included people of German, Roma, Polish, Swedish, Irish, Jewish fleeing Russian pogroms, Latin American, Middle Eastern, among them after 1948 Palestinians, and African heritage. It is a place where different languages, religions, and cultures coexist in the womb of God's earth without colonial integration, though not free from its ire. The latter is felt in the absence of the native Mandawakatan Dakota people who sojourned locally along the river in a seasonal encampment under a succession of chiefs known as Little Crow. After Minnesota became a territory in 1849, colonial merchants were eager to, quote, expand and build bigger barns. So, by 1851, the nomadic tribes of God were driven out of nearly all of Elohim's earth in Minnesota and eastern Dakota in the Traverse de Sioux and Mendota treaties. The same colonial resentments resurfaced first in the suppression of the German language by the, quote, Minnesota Commission of Public Safety, and later in the 1930s during the Great Depression, when in several attempts to address the, quote, Mexican problem, Ramsey County officials repatriated no less than 15% of the Mexican population many of whom were U.S. citizens. This was the West Side Flats, and for about a hundred years, from the 1850s to the 1960s, life bloomed there. A unique neighborhood in Minnesota and the wider U.S., the flats were dense, low-income, polyglot, striving, unpaved, and unpainted. In this sense, despite its material and at times extreme poverty, and because of its mix of languages under constant outside pressure, it is reminiscent of El Andalus, the fleeting memory of a golden age of tolerance, cultural exchange, and common sense. Despite regular flooding in the old neighborhood, city officials did nothing to address the issue or assist West Side residents. Only after the demolition of the flats and the deportation, deportation, in other words, integration into the melting pot of its residents in 1963, did the quote, community builders of Ramsey County install flood control mechanisms on the riverfront. What they did to the Mexicans down on the old west side to make them move like that and not compensate them and give them the bare minimum. What they did to destroy a community like that is wrong. George Avalos. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 38 to 39. Today's introduction is an excerpt from my new book, Dark Sayings, Diary of an American Priest, published through OCAPS Press. It's available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and many of your favorite online booksellers. Check the show notes or visit OCAPSPress.org to learn more. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 501 of the Bible as Literature Podcast. 
Rich, you and I were talking this morning about how deceptive modern life is. And I want to explain what I mean. I'm sitting here on the west side in St. Paul, Minnesota, in a locality where not long ago, I'm talking the mid 1800s, Native Americans roamed free. And there was a community called Little Crow that here along the river, where our churches would settle. And the community was called Little Crow. It was the Shebet Little Crow because their patriarch, their chief was called Little Crow. Now you would say, is it the community of Little Crow or is the patriarch called Little Crow? Well, I, I don't think it really matters. It was the Mendawakan Dakota people, but their patriarch was Little Crow, so they are referred to as Little Crow. And then you might ask, well, which Little Crow? Who was Little Crow, Father Mark? My answer to you is, that's an invalid question. Little Crow is a function. He's not a person. Because there were a series of patriarchs, of tribal chiefs, called Little Crow. But then, as a typical colonial person, a person coming from the vantage point of exceptional superiority and white privilege, meaning you really believe that you look down and from above, which is why scripture keeps making fun of you, you'll ask, yes, but who was the historical Little Crow? Which one is Little Crow? I'm talking about the real person Little Crow, Father Mark. To which I will sit back, calling to mind the name of my father's Ishaq and laugh at you. Because Little Crow, is the name of their Shebet. There was a series of Little Crow. It doesn't matter who he was. His function was Little Crow. And that's who they were on the banks of the Mississippi until the colonials wiped them out to build their cities. And we're talking about the mid-1800s. Now, just go a few decades later to the early 20th century, to the Middle East, to my motherland, where at the turn of the century in the early 1900s, more than 70% of the land was not owned by anyone in Palestine. People shared the land. You had Bedouins, and townspeople living side by side, the land was shared by families. People with larger families were accountable to cultivate more of the land. And people shared the produce so that everyone could live in common. There's a link here, which is the colonial mindset and colonial tyranny, which was spreading around the planet at the time. And we're talking a century ago, which means that it was only a century ago that this mentality of the ownership of property was consolidating its power and wiping out poor people. It was happening here and it was happening there. And I mention this because we've been fooled and tricked into believing that the way in which we live today is the only way of living, and it's not so. We've been betrayed into believing that the proposition of Scripture is hyperbolic. Now, it's hyperbolic in the way that it totally cancels everything in order to open our minds to the folly of idolatry. But the proposition of biblical shepherdism is not hyperbolic because it is the way in which we were created in the womb of God's earth and we have turned our backs on it.
And I want everyone who hears this podcast to hear what I'm saying. It was only a century ago in Palestine that more than 70% of the land was shared in common. And we messed it up by exporting colonialism to the Middle East, just as we messed it up for the Native Americans, the people of Little Crow here on St. Paul's West Side. It needs to be said. You know, I was walking recently in my neighborhood. I appreciate in my neighborhood, there's a lot of old trees and forests. And so you walk down the road and it feels like you're walking through a forest. And I always enjoyed that. And it just occurred to me that at any time, any one of those landowners can just decide, I'm going to build a shed and just cut down the trees. They do what their land, what they want to do, and they have no responsibility towards me. The only way they would have responsibility towards me is if there were a law, which there is not. But the only way you have a law is if you have a council of elders that pass down the law, which is what we call, you know, the city council or the state senate or whatever. But there's always a word, there's a rule that's passed down. People function together if they share this common word that's impressed upon them. They don't get to decide. It has to be imposed on them. Even if they come to an agreement at some point, later on, if someone decides to change their mind, they say, no, there's an agreement and it is imposed on us now. There is an authority that imposes that. In this passage in Luke, already we've seen the tension because we have the word of God that's imposed, but then we have another word that's imposed. We have demons, we have lots of kings, we have the community. Everyone has their idea of what is supposed to happen next. Last week when we spoke, Jesus rebuked the demons, and they left. They listened unequivocally, without hesitation, to the word that Jesus imposed on them, which came from his Father. This is now a theme that we see going throughout this chapter, where it is this word that determines everything. Ever since Jesus was declared, as God said, this is my son, now he has the imprimatur to speak on his behalf. And this is what we see happening, and lo and behold, the demons in nature itself follow this word. The human beings, they're still trying to decide which authority are they going to follow. But interestingly, the demons and the nature know that these words of the community, these words of the kings, that sort of thing, they're not bound by. Then he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. Now, there's something interesting happening in this verse. There are two terms which normally people would never in their wildest dreams in the English language associate with each other, especially the way it's typically translated in English. The first term is synagogue. Here in the sentence, synagogis. It corresponds, of course, in Hebrew to the word aida, which means assembly, but also, as it's used in the Old Testament, it could mean a swarm, a flock, a throng, of course, a community. Now, Father Paul, in a recent podcast, explained that the ecclesia, the kohal, is the community that is moving because it's following the voice. Remember, in Arabic and in Hebrew, it's to call. To call out, that's what the verb kahal means, kala in Arabic. But the synagogi, the aida, is where the flock gathers. So what's interesting then, when you hear this word that is translated as suffering, sinechomeni, you imagine no connection. You can find no connection in translation in English. What on earth would the synagogue, which in plain language simply means a place of worship until you unpack its Hebrew correspondence via the Septuagint, what on earth would it have to do 
with, in English, the word suffering. Now, if you approach it theologically, we get into some big discussion about suffering and healing, which is how people talk in the churches, which is nonsensical to the text. Nonsensical. There's something else happening here. Now, the word asad in Hebrew, which corresponds to the Greek sinachomeni, means to retain, restrain. In Arabic, asara is to squeeze or to wring out. Now, this is not foreign to the Greek, because the literal translation of the Greek means held together. So something is happening here. You're coming from the place where those who heard the voice of the shepherd, the flocks, the mishpaha in the wilderness, who follow the voice of the shepherd, were gathered to hear the teaching of Jesus. But now you're coming to the bait, the house, and bait, of course, is the same in Arabic and Hebrew, the household of Simon, where someone is restrained, they're squeezed, they are being held. And what's interesting about the Greek, it can also mean or imply imprisonment. So you have a contrast between the place of gathering to hear the instruction and the household of Simon, where his mother-in-law is being held captive. She is ill, but there's an implication of imprisonment. So Jesus is coming to set her free, to help her. These subtleties are not theological. They are not hidden meanings. They are not below the text or above the text. They are connections found in the language that someone who is familiar with the original languages doesn't have to invent. They are there to be worked out in the language that the average person familiar with the Semitic would pick up on. He got up from the synagogue, Anastas, standing up from the synagogue. I thought he was standing up in the synagogue anyway when he was reading from the scroll. He gets up from the synagogue and goes into the house. He's down low, and then he goes up as he moves from the synagogue to the house. And the word sinahomeni, she is suffering from. I, I find that an odd translation of that. The King James says was taken with. It comes from the root echo, which means have, and seen, which means with, like symphony. So it's holding together, like you said, Father, for people who are held, including against their will. You know, when Jesus is being mocked, it's by the ones who are holding him. She is held by this fever. She is entrapped by, you know, held with. This is the same root as in 33, the person who has the spirit of a demon, having with or having the demon, it's using the same word. And this is significant because the way that one is held by a fever or holds a demon, it doesn't matter because Jesus uses the same methods for getting rid of them. Whether it's the spirit of a demon or or it's a fever. And this I find fascinating because people talk about, oh, you know, when the Bible talks about demons and sicknesses, they're, you know, it's just an ancient understanding of what a sickness was, that they thought it was caused by evil spirits. No, the first one was explicitly the spirit of a demon, and this one is explicitly a fever. So people talk about the ancient world like they don't understand the concept of sickness in the way that we do, so they think that mental illness is different than a sickness like a fever. And I'll tell you what, in the modern day, we understand very clearly that they're different things as well, because no one goes into therapy for a fever. Your fever won't go away with a word. But your mental illness can be helped with a word in a way that a fever can't be. The importance of these two concepts and the way that Scripture conceives of these different concepts is significant. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she immediately got up and waited on them. I am thankful, Richard, that you mentioned the term Anastas from the previous verse, 
Because although it's the same root in Greek in verse 39, ephistimi is kind of striking because you usually think of anastas as being related to kum, comma in Arabic. But ephistimi is associated frequently with Ahmad. That I find curious. What is this distinction? Why would we go with Ahmad in the Old Testament and not with Qum? Ahmad also means to stand, to lean against, to place, to impose, but also to carry a burden. The cognate can literally mean a pillar, to strive after, Ammadun, a purpose or an intent, but as a noun, it's Amdun, someone who is taking on a burden. Jesus is shouldering something. He is standing up to put something on his shoulders. So I find it interesting. He's standing up as a reference, which corresponds to, relates to this function of the one who is raised as God's reference to stand out upon the earth. It also connects to the teaching of Isaiah. Remember that only God stands out in Isaiah. This is the function of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians. I find it interesting that Jesus is coming to set free the captives who are imprisoned and to heal the sick. He is fulfilling the scroll of Isaiah in the household of Simon who ultimately will try to undermine his function as God's prince in the story. So once he sets her free, what does she do? She gets up and she serves him. She waits on them. The other interesting term here, Richard, is this word epitimesen, which means to rebuke. The term ga'ar means to rebuke, to reproach, to curse, even to <laughs> do so insultingly. <laughs> Actually, this was an interesting word. It's a classical Arabic term. It can refer to cattle mooing. <laughs> I don't know how much this brings to bear on the text, but everybody knows that in spoken Arabic, yajar is a noisy person. You tell a noisy person to be quiet. It can also refer to a female hyena, because the same triliteral in Arabic refers to dung, and the female hyena rolls in her dung to disguise her scent. In any case, to rebuke is to shame and to scold and to curse, to speak insultingly, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing. And the demons have to submit and accept because Jesus is the representative of the Most High God. That's the beautiful thing that ties this verse in with verse 35, where Jesus epitimisen the demons, and here he epitimisen the fever. He rebuked the demon in the exact same way as he did the fever. It's through his word that he's able to make this happen. Also, the connection you made between Anastasis and Ephistimi is apropos because in 38, Jesus stands up from the synagogue, and now he is standing over the mother-in-law of Simon. In English, we get a hint of this because stand up versus stand over, stand up versus stand, one implies an action and one is more stationary. So he stands up from the synagogue that implies a kind of motion as he leaves the synagogue, but then he goes in order to stand over this woman and he rebukes the fever. So not only is he standing over the fever, but his word controls the fever just like his word controlled the demon. The demons were ready to obey, and they left. And here, as soon as the fever leaves the woman, she immediately ministers to him the ikoni, which is the akonia, service. So in Acts, this is the famous scene where they're serving at tables. 
this is what the meaning comes from. You have a guest at your house and you immediately begin to serve him. Now, this doesn't help the feminists at all that, you know, the first thing is like, oh, you're down with a fever. And the first thing you have to do is then make dinner for the person who healed you. I'm not going to get into patriarchy. I'm not going to get into anything political here, but this is what happens. Just as she is responsible for serving at the table of the guest, we have the deacons like Stephen in Acts were there to serve at the tables of the poor. There is this responsibility of obedience to serve. And the one who gives life to her, she serves. This is not because Jesus wouldn't have had anything to eat otherwise as if Jesus depended on her. This is because she reflects her obedience towards the one who gave her life. It's the maintaining of life. I mean, she was imprisoned. In the story of Scripture, a woman who was held captive and enslaved was liberated by the Messiah. It has nothing to do with your own internal arguments with your own internal false gods about your own internal problems, which are part and parcel of colonialism. So please don't try to drag us into your argument based on your false premise. There is no God but the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only king. He is the only premise and the only reference. I no longer want to even entertain the false premise. It's like, why should we even entertain it? Because it's a quagmire and a lost discussion. If one cannot hear that Jesus set this woman free, one cannot hear. One does not have ears. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.